All right. So welcome to our part two of our paper canes and pesky prizes story from last month. There will be a little recap, so don't worry if you don't remember or haven't recently watched the replay of that one. So we had a few topics that are coming in new today or like that were kind of left over and hadn't been covered in the part one. And so the ones that were yet to be covered were Senior Sport, Guinness, uh, a bit more of the idea of contagious forgetting of words um, and we and imitating animals. And then last time we added in for this time photo bombing, the phrase do it for the gram. <laughs> incorrect Google translations. Uh, owls lying down. <laughs> <laughs> unexpected tourist <laughs> attractions that are great so sort of hidden adventures and when you get mistaken for someone who knows the language <laughs> so our poem today is called court and it's about photo bombers <laughs> smiling in soft sunshine all straw hats and dappled grins they didn't know about the sneak who slipped behind with antlers on and peered between their beautiful beams to shock them later on. Filming that delightful scene, a conversation by the swing in summer twilight golden with fresh fruit and sparkling lemonade. They didn't know about the chap, Hawaiian shirt and Crocs on, who wandered past, got in his car and leaked the real time space location. Caught in frame where they shouldn't be, carried in the data sphere, the cheeky and the accidental make their way on through the years for later folks to ponder on. Who is that face behind his arm? Forever naughty mysteries, the photo bomber histories. <laughs> okay. So our part two of our paper crane story is titled Do It For The Gram. Previously in Paper Cranes and Pesky Prizes, Betty, an 87 year old grandma and larpa, steps in at the last minute to teach paper crane folding at her granddaughter Anae's school harmony day event. At the event, Betty is alarmed when she wins the main raffle prize of a discounted trip to Europe, for which she feels unprepared. Making the most of it, however, Betty decides to try setting up an Instagram account featuring the travel adventures of a paper crane named Carrie. Arriving in Paris, Betty is excited to run into Instagram cat personality, the Scots Paws, known in real life as Broderick, and his owner, Fraser. Betty and Fraser have just discussed their potential Instagram rivalry, but have now been mistaken for travelling companions by the information desk attendant. Do you need assistance in English? The clerk on the desk repeated, frowning at Betty's unconvincing we. Oui. <laughs> Fraser put Broderick down and faced the attendant. Yes, please, he replied hurriedly. Betty removed her glasses, several hankies, various lipsticks, her clear plastic bag of liquids, an A to Z address book, and a vampire novel from her handbag, placing them for safekeeping on the information desk counter, and got out the printout of her itinerary, which showed her hotel booking details. The attendant leaned over to see as Betty pointed. What is the best way to get to the Mercure Hotel, Betty? asked, glancing over at Fraser, waiting for him to ask about wherever it was he wanted to go. But Fraser merely looked interested in knowing the answer to Betty's question, as the clerk gave directions to the train station and showed Betty the timetable. Fraser? Betty inquired eventually. Did you have a question? Fraser shrugged. Are there any sports events taking place in the city this week? The desk attendant gave him a strange look. You are not aware of the marathon? Fraser looked sheepish. 
Oh, of course, yes. Are you looking for a particular sport? Betty set about putting everything back into her handbag while Fraser and the attendant got into a discussion about golf courses, which went on for some minutes. Once she was packed, Betty picked up her train timetable and pulled up the handle on her wheeled suitcase. She was giving the suitcase a cross look as she contemplated how to pull it while also using her walking frame when Fraser took hold of it. I can bring this to the train station for you, he offered. Betty peered at him over her glasses. Fraser, are you going this way? Fraser shrugged again. I haven't really planned very far ahead, he admitted. Betty eyed the young man with growing scepticism. It seemed that the assumption the airport staff were making that Fraser was travelling with Betty was quickly becoming accurate by virtue of Fraser's inability to organise himself. <laughs> Why are you in France, Fraser? she demanded, as they made their slow way through the terminal. I'm supposed to do some research and publicity for my family's golf course. Post about other sporting grounds and events, that sort of thing. Show we're networking and aware of the rest of the sporting world. Fraser stopped walking to let Broderick trot out in front of the suitcases as the cat was having some difficulty avoiding the feet of other travellers and the small wheels of Betty's bag and walker. In Paris, Betty clarified, askance. Fraser gave up on manoeuvring the bags around Broderick and stooped to pick the cat up, settling him around the back of his neck like a scarf. Not specifically, all around Europe. I see, murmured Betty. She did love Broderick's Instagram, but she wasn't altogether delighted at the idea that this youth and his cat might trail along after her for her entire trip. Then again, she could probably learn quite a lot about Instagram from Fraser along the way. Something about Fraser's total lack of a plan, an unconcerned approach to travelling, suggested that his trip was being financed by someone else, and that their requirements for what exactly Fraser ought to be doing while he was away were fairly loose ones. On one hand, this had the potential to make Fraser rather a pain in the rear end. Mm. On the other, it meant he would probably be happy to go along with what Betty wanted to do and assist with such frustrations as heavy bags and stares, so long as there were Instagrammable moments along the way that had at least vague relevance to sports. I'm heading out of Paris in the morning to stay in a little village near Nice, Betty informed Fraser aiming to put the young man's character to the test. If he only wanted to spend time in the big cities, the match in what they wanted to photograph for Instagram would be poor anyway. That's wonderful, beamed Fraser. It's always so much nicer in the country than in town, I think. I might be able to find a golf course out there if you don't mind me tagging along. Betty tried not to sigh. She'd been somewhat looking forward to the peace and quiet. On the train, Broderick went to sleep on top of Betty's handbag, and Fraser showed Betty how to use the filters and editing tools in the Instagram app that she'd always skipped over in the past. Betty propped Carrie Crane up in the window and took a video of France rushing by outside, which Fraser said she could post to her story later. It wasn't entirely clear to Betty why some things were stories and others were not but she supposed this was one of the advantages of having found herself a coach. At the hotel, the reception staff automatically addressed Betty and did so in fluent French. Apparently, being 87 years old with a walking frame prompted the assumption that one was only travelling locally. <laughs> Betty managed bonjour and then continued in English, hoping this would clarify things. The staff members all looked at one another and handled Betty's check-in from that point on with a brusqueness that suggested disdain. Are there any other rooms available for tonight? asked Fraser, stepping forward with Broderick in a rare show of initiative. The staff, who had presumably also assumed that Fraser was being chaperoned by Betty, 
looked surprised and confused. The room can be arranged for two, one of them proposed. Fraser looked at Betty. She sighed. All right. Apparently, when you allowed young Instagrammers to travel with you, there was no escape. Okay. She noticed that no one asked any questions about Broderick, who had grown fed up with the humans around him talking and was currently curled up on top of Fraser's suitcase, occasionally opening one golden eye to glare at the source of loud noises. After the room was rearranged to accommodate Fraser, and various extras that Betty hadn't paid for had mysteriously appeared, Fraser announced that he was hungry. I want a certain food in particular, he mused, but I can't seem to think of what it's called. Betty sighed and put down the brochure she'd been reading. Broderick sat on the brochure and settled down in a kind of crouch that dared anyone to try to retrieve it from beneath him. <laughs> What sort of food is it? Sort of eggy with pastry on. <laughs> Betty frowned. I think I know what you mean, but now I can't think of the word for it either, she mused. I, however, am 87 years old, so I'm permitted to forget the words for things sometimes. <laughs> she removed a small mountain of things from her handbag to get her reading glasses. Shall we go out and see if a cafe nearby has this eggy pastry? A bakery would usually have it, I think, Fraser answered, clipping Broderick's lead back on. At the bakery, Betty just wanted one of the nice fresh rolls with herbs baked into them that were displayed in a basket behind the counter. Unfortunately, there were 10 or more other kinds of rolls and breads in the same rack, and their lack of labels and general crowding meant that Betty would need to be able to describe which one she wanted, a task which her limited French was definitely not up to. She got out her small travel handbook of European languages and had a look in the food section for French. Since it wasn't much use to say bread, the guide was not very informative. Let's try Google Translate, suggested Fraser, pulling out a very slim, shiny smartphone. Betty peered over his shoulder as he typed in roll. <laughs> Le roll bont per se, Betty tried. This earned her a very strange look from the young woman serving. <laughs> Betty decided it was a lost cause. Baguette, she offered. <laughs> It was only later that she learned she'd been asking for rotating parsley. <laughs> Betty and Fraser left the bakery with a whole baguette poking out of the basket on Betty's walker and a very pretty fruit tart, which Fraser had been able to ask for because it was labelled in the glass case at the front. <laughs> Is that the sort of eggy pastry you were thinking of? Betty asked him, a cheeky sceptical note in her voice. No, replied Fraser. It's very lovely though, isn't it, Broderick? He coaxed the cat up onto a bench so that they could take a selfie with it. <laughs> I think we ought to find some cheese or something to go with this bread, Betty decided. I can't abide plain sandwiches. We might be eating a lot of camembert on baguette, Fraser replied. Why is that, Betty inquired taking out Carrie Crane and placing her so she was sitting atop the baguette for a picture. Well, do you know how to say the names of any other cheeses? Fraser shook his head at Betty's framing of her photo and reached over to turn the camera on to selfie mode. Oh, I see. Betty held Carrie Crane and the baguette up to the lens. Well, at least Camembert is very nice. Fraser nodded and shrugged. Let's get a picture of Carrie and Broderick together, he proposed. I can introduce your account and that should help you get some followers. Betty obediently put Carrie Crane up on the bench between Broderick's large furry paws. Broderick swatted Carrie to the ground and they had to reattempt the photo 15 times. <laughs> By the time they all boarded the train heading towards Nice the next day, Carrie the paper crane had pretended to eat camembert three times. 
being held up in the bakery window with a background of beautiful pastries, being made to look like a pterosaur landing on the Eiffel Tower, almost fallen into the Seine in a gust of wind, and showing up how small the Mona Lisa really was. While Fraser happily selfied about 80% of his Instagram photos, Betty diligently kept her face out of hers. Carrie should, she asserted, be allowed to develop a personality without the world knowing that her associated human sported a walking frame and a collection of twin sets. <laughs> Broderick stubbornly persisted in attacking Carrie whenever the two were posed together. So Fraser had embraced this attitude and written what Betty had to admit were pretty funny captions about their rivalry. The tactic seemed to be quite effective, and Betty's mobile phone was making more noise and fuss from the Instagram notifications than it had made in all its previous months of reluctant use. Mm -hmm. The accommodation that Betty had booked at their next destination was in great contrast to the hotel in Paris, being essentially the cottage next door to the host's cottage. The key was to be found under a statue of a tortoise on the porch. A window box filled with colourful annuals became rather flattened when Broderick identified it as the sunniest spot to stretch out his vast grey furry expanse, and the small kitchen was already supplied with a basket of three baguettes and a fridge smelly with three cheeses. After making some awfully strong coffee that made Betty wince and wish for tea, Fraser started poring over Google Maps in search of green spaces that might feature sports grounds. Having identified what looked like a village green, he and Betty made their very gradual way through the narrow streets, Broderick stalking ahead of them and attracting a lot of attention from the locals. As they approached a market, which Betty was hoping to explore instead of whatever sporting activity Fraser might discover, Betty spotted some locals who were taking great care in removing weeds and small rocks from an area of empty sandy soil. There seemed to be some lively debate occurring over the proximity of the nearest market stall. Betty watched the scene curiously until she saw one man open a telltale case containing metal balls. She stopped and prodded at Fraser's arm with the umbrella she'd cautiously brought from the cottage. Look over there. Sportsman, it looks like they're going to play petonk. Mm. Fraser looked and beamed. Betty, you should have a go. Betty shook her head sternly. Come on, Betty, do it for the gram, urged Fraser. <laughs> Young man, I do not know that phrase, but if, as I assume, it refers to my efforts on Instagram, I've told you already that my account will only be featuring Carrie, not me. I think somehow that a paper crane would have great difficulty in playing a game of ball. Nonsense, Betty. Broderick does golf photos all the time and he's a cat. <laughs> Fraser insisted, <laughs> taking hold of Betty's walker and half towing her over to where the locals were setting up their game. I can take some pictures for you of Carrie spectating. Before Betty could protest further, Fraser had approached the Petonk players and was attempting to explain that he and Betty wanted to join in the game. The locals seemed quite perplexed and a bit cross. Betty felt that this was due to more than the language barrier. She suspected they were imposing on a competition between long-term rivals, who were not thrilled at the prospect of other parties getting involved. One of the players was gesticulating angrily at another and talking very fast. Somehow, however, Fraser, who had a kind of naive innocence about him, proved too difficult to turn down, and he fastened Broderick's leash to a nearby outdoor table, freeing up his hands to be filled with three shiny balls. Broderick climbed onto the table and went to sleep in the case from which the balls had been taken, earning him a glare from the case's owner. Betty and Fraser took it in turns playing camera person for one another, much to the annoyance of the other players, who were all the more confused by Betty's attempts to get Carrie near the bowls. Some of them seemed to quite like Broderick, however, and he even had his picture taken with a few of them. Betty discovered 
once she got used to the unexpected weight of the balls, that she was actually quite good at the game. Not ever having been much for sports, she was feeling rather pleased with herself and had even forgiven Fraser for filming her at one point. When suddenly, an unrelated thought entered her head, just as a member of the opposing team was taking their shot. Quiche! exploded Betty, loudly, <laughs> causing the player to jump and cut short their swing. That was what you <laughs> wanted, Fraser! Quiche! <laughs> Betty had been right in her initial assessment that these Patonk players were very serious about their game. The opposing team turned to her, expressions wild, and began to furiously berate her for spoiling their player's shot, in words that Betty didn't know, but nonetheless could definitely understand. <laughs> she and Fraser returned their balls and slunk off in shame. <laughs> Once they were a safe distance away, however... Fraser grinned and patted Betty on the back. That was fun, he declared. Way to do it for the gram, gran. <laughs> Betty gave him a glare. Fraser, I'm not your gran, and we made those people very cross. It was really a dreadful <laughs> business. <laughs> Fraser seemed only mildly discouraged by this rebuke. I have an idea, he went on despite her. We should try out the most unique sports we can find everywhere we visit. Imagine how exciting Carrie's Instagram would be if she's involved in the action on ice or underwater or flying on an arrow. <laughs> Betty was quick to point out that Carrie would disintegrate underwater and that she, at 87, would not be very safe on ice skates. She got the impression, however, that Fraser was not listening. <laughs> her suspicion was confirmed that evening when, upon scrolling through her feed, pondering which Patonk photo to post, Betty discovered a post from Fraser featuring the video of her playing that he'd filmed between Broderick's ears. It bore the hashtag, Gran doing it for the gram. The <laughs> caption read, Loving hanging out with this new human, 87 and scared of nothing. Hashtag Graham the Brave. Hashtag Scott's Paws Finds a Gran. <laughs> Betty narrowed her eyes over her fork full of cock of all and returned it to the bowl. Fraser, I have told you not to post my face on the gram. Fraser sipped some wine and looked unperturbed. This all right. I didn't tag you or anything. Actually, can I tag your LARPing account? <laughs> No, snapped Betty crossly, and it isn't a LARPing account. I just post vampire outfits sometimes because I'm not sure how else to save them when I delete things off my phone. <laughs> oh, Fraser nodded. I can help you with that. <laughs> Betty grumbled to herself a bit and returned to her dinner. She could see how Fraser had persuaded the Patonk players earlier. He just sort of stubbornly refused to believe that you were cross with him until you forgot that you were. <laughs> it was in a restaurant in Belgium where Broderick had his own seat at the table and Betty was trying to prevent him from stealing the meat out of her beer stew that Fraser spotted the poster about roller derby. <laughs> he got up from the table, almost colliding with a waiter, and took a picture on his phone. Betty, he exclaimed, sliding excitedly back into his seat. I think I've found our sport. <laughs> Betty dabbed beer sauce off her chin, pulled out a compact mirror and reapplied her coral lipstick. I don't think so, young man, she told him, putting a bread roll into a spare napkin and sliding it into her handbag. Rolling about on skates and trying to overtake aggressive walls of young people would be terribly unsafe for me. I am 87, I might remind you. Fraser wriggled excitedly in his seat like a child and almost knocked over his beer, which Betty suspected he'd already had too much of. Yes, but look, it says there's a seniors team. Betty didn't believe him and wasn't obliged to concede that he was right because she'd left her glasses in the hotel room and couldn't read the text. <laughs> 
In the morning, however, she let her curiosity get the better of her and gave in to Fraser's repeated requests that she do it for the gram, allowing him to drag her along as he followed a Google map to the hole where the roller derby apparently took place. Betty was both horrified and delighted to see a number of older individuals wearing small shorts, knee pads, and something akin to war paint, and using, in some cases, specially adapted fast-rolling walking frames or sports wheelchairs to get around at extreme speeds. She was quickly greeted by one of these skating warriors, who seemed to want to know if Betty could make up the numbers for their team. Betty tried to explain that she didn't really know the rules or have any gear or have any experience roller skating beyond the age of seven. But strangely <laughs> enough, her phrase book was a bit deficient when it came to roller derby terms. <laughs> Fraser affixed Carrie the crane to one of Betty's roller skates and she found herself being helped into knee pads and other pieces of clothing that looked suspiciously like pieces of armour. It took her a few tries to stand up with the extremely mobile new walker. And once upright, Betty discovered that it was virtually impossible to remain stationary. Her impromptu teammates had to form a kind of net with their arms and walkers and skate in the opposite direction in order to catch and reposition Betty towards the starting point. This same inability to stop moving or indeed slow down proved it seemed to be beneficial to the team once the match began. Betty zoomed about in what she knew to be an almost entirely random way, but which proved accidentally effective in obstructing the opposing skater who was attempting to pass, which, as Betty understood things, was the object. No one particularly minded that they had to tow and push Betty back to a seat to get her off the track again. It did, Betty had to admit, all look rather impressive in Fraser's photos. Carrie the Crane was a bit of a blur, but Betty took a photo of her balanced inside a roller skate afterwards, so that was okay. Fraser fared less well on the track, owing to the sufficient numbers on the existing teams and the fact that he kept falling over and being unable to get up, regardless of attempted instruction from several seasoned skaters. Betty thought Fraser might be sad that he didn't get to participate as she had, but he just optimistically asked other skaters to hold Broderick for photos until he found someone who spoke fairly good English and didn't mind <laughs> taking the indignant feline for a ride around the track between matches. Broderick, Betty thought, was probably very glad to leave Belgium. She had to admit, it was somewhat of a relief to leave behind the need for Google Translate and her unhelpful phrasebook and head for shores where Guinness, music and peaceful nature lay ahead. At least a peaceful time with the odd bit of frivolity was what Betty expected. She didn't know that the travel agency that had planned her tour had specifically selected the dates in Ireland to coincide with a local festival in the town they were visiting. <laughs> The bus took an additional half hour to deposit Betty Fraser and assorted other tourists and disgruntled locals in the town centre. People were spilling out of the pubs and the village green was covered in people, stalls, fairground rides and the occasional flustered horse. Traditional music was emanating from the town hall. Broderick flattened his ears, but Fraser's eyes lit up. Maybe there'll be one-off local competitions as part of this, he remarked. As it happened, he was right. After depositing their luggage at the bed and breakfast, Betty and Fraser went to see what was happening in the town hall. A number of things were in fact happening at once, which made it difficult to discern at first. Along one wall, there was a display of lace, which was being perused by a woman with a clipboard, while a number of locals, presumably the makers of the lace, stood nervously back. Betty wanted to take a closer look, but it was clear that the woman with the clipboard was not to be disturbed under any circumstances, so she kept her distance. Apparently not disturbing the judging of the lace were the musicians, who were currently a group of three, playing Yulin pipes, whistle and accordion, under the inspection of a bespectacled gentleman seated at a small desk. 
back to back with him, another judge was watching three dancers who all seemed to be doing completely different dances and struggling to avoid colliding with one another in the small allotted space. Although the steps looked utterly exhausting, Betty quickly perceived that the three ladies currently performing were of a fairly senior age. Fraser, she realised, was looking at her. <laughs> no, she told him sternly, preempting the suggestion that was clearly on the tip of his tongue. I cannot learn to do that in an afternoon. <laughs> The three dancers finished their dances at this point and all took a bow, two of them looking as if they were taking care not to further strain their backs. <laughs> Fraser, Betty realised rather too late, was reading a sign that stood to one side of the dancers' flooring. Betty, he called, receiving some stern glances from other people for his volume. Look, there's a come and try. <laughs> <laughs> Betty shook her head, edging her walker closer to Fraser to avoid raising her own voice over the music. Do I look like a person who can jump to you, Fraser? She demanded. <laughs> Fraser made a pouty face. For the gram, he pleaded. <laughs> Later, after some Guinness, Betty found herself returning to the town hall with Fraser wearing leggings. <laughs> Betty did not like leggings, but she also did not like the way the dancers earlier had been flashing their underwear with every kick. Not that she expected to be doing any kicking like that. She was pleased to see that the three older performers from earlier had now also donned leggings. She was less pleased when they started heading straight for her, with a taller four-wheeled walking frame much like the one she'd used for roller derby. Mm. I can't jump, she informed them immediately, expecting this to be the end of the matter. Mm. Oh, don't worry, you can walk the steps, the middle one told her brightly. Betty was promptly whisked off and made to fake hop, sidestep, and perform something called a Kaylee swing, which for Betty involved the other party holding on to her walking frame and attempting to scoot her around in a circle while Betty shuffled her feet as fast as possible in attempt to keep up. <laughs> Her consolation, as she did her best to keep her toes away from the walker's wheels, was that whenever she caught sight of Fraser, he appeared to be falling over almost as much as he had on skates and was causing his instructors great distress with his complete lack of rhythm. <laughs> Betty, with her walker in tow, was managing to at least move about mostly on the beat. Fraser, who presumably could jump and wasn't burdened by towing a set of wheels, seemed to be sliding around the place as though waltzing when the music was possibly the most unwaltz like Betty had ever heard, and now had several times managed to kick the person next to him. He seemed, however, to be greatly enjoying the experience. Broderick had been offered a cushion on a chair to one side of the room and was sitting on the chair beside it while all this was going on, eyeing the prancing humans disdainfully. When the dance lesson was concluded and Betty turned back to the chair where the cat had been, he was no longer there. Fraser appeared at Betty's side, looking alarmed. Have you seen Broderick, he puffed. Betty shook her head, perching on the seat side of her walking frame to pat her brow with a hanky and reset the pins in her hair. Did you film me, she asked, trying to keep her tone stern. <laughs> Fraser, however, was looking around anxiously. I have to look for Broderick, he said. He's the heir to quite a big fortune. Someone might be after him. <laughs> I beg your pardon, spluttered Betty. <laughs> but Fraser was already out of earshot, checking the toilets. Betty stood up and inched her tired-footed way over to peer out of the main doors. Broderick was out the front of the hall, comfortably, it seemed, curled up atop a prize-winning giant cabbage. Betty got out her phone and Carrie Crane and took a picture. Then she went back inside to retrieve Fraser. The last stop on Betty's European tour was Switzerland. She had tried to point out to that resourceful teacher, Yvette, who'd convinced her to buy the raffle tickets, 
that won her this trip, that Italy was not on the tour. It was Betty's learning Italian that Yvette had used to justify why the holiday was worth her winning. But now that it came to it, Betty didn't mind so much that she wouldn't be obliged to put her Italian skills to the test. She just wondered what unlikely sporting activity Fraser could possibly find in Switzerland for them to attempt, and what the young man would do when she left to return to Australia and he was obliged to either return home or continue his travels alone. The first question did not take long to answer. Betty and Fraser got out of their taxi at the bed and breakfast, and there, behind the peak of the building's roof, the sky was full of balloons. Hot air balloons. Mm -hmm. Betty laughed in delight. Excuse me, she tapped on the taxi driver's window. What are the balloons here for? The driver stuck their head out of the window and looked up. That would be the European Hot Air Ballooning Championship. Betty looked at Fraser. No, said Fraser, I don't like heights. <laughs> Betty pursed her lips. Come on, Fraser, do it for the gram, she told him. <laughs> Betty was quite disappointed when it turned out that taking tourists for a fly was against the rules for the hot air balloon pilots. Still, it was very impressive to watch them inflating their balloons with the help of their crews and many were willing to have photos of Broderick and Carrie, which was something. Then Fraser got a certain look in his eyes that Betty had come to associate with some form or other of doing it for the gram. <laughs> what, she demanded. What if, Fraser whispered, one of the pilots was willing to take Carrie up with them and get pictures for you? Betty wasn't sure. She knew the balloons would have burning propane fueling their flight, which was risky for Carrie, not to mention the wind. But would the pictures be worth it? Should she risk it for the gram? <laughs> Carrie was eventually handed to a Scottish pilot who folded her up and zipped her into a pocket, promising to get some good shots. Betty found herself watching anxiously as the balloon took flight. Roderick looked as if he was glad to be on the ground. Since the balloon flight was expected to take around an hour and Betty kept worrying about Carrie's fate in the air, Fraser proposed wandering into some nearby woods where some kind of attraction was marked on the map in their brochure. Betty reluctantly agreed and tottered alongside Fraser, cautiously avoiding roots. Just when Betty was about to suggest that this walk was not suitable for someone with a walking frame, they rounded a corner to see something remarkable. The trees throughout the small clearing ahead of them were full of elaborate tree houses and castle-like constructions. Some people in Tolkien-esque costumes sat in some of them, and on the ground there was basket weaving, cooking and carving in progress. One of the basket weavers had an owl sitting on her shoulder. Wow, chorus Betty and Fraser. Betty had to sit down on a stump that was carved into a chair and Fraser negotiated getting pictures with the owl. Have you seen the account that owl's lying down? He asked Betty after she'd cautiously let the owl be put on her arm for a photo. Betty shook her head, well aware that Fraser was trying to distract her from Carrie Crane being a great distance overhead. They're very funny when they lie down, Fraser informed her. Sort of stick their legs out the back as if they've fallen on their faces. <laughs> he got down on the forest floor, seeming to forget that he was wearing a very nice vest. Sort of like this. He face planted <laughs> in the leaf litter, arms by his sides, <laughs> legs out behind him and face turned wide eyed towards Betty. <laughs> Betty laughed. That can't be right. Fraser rolled over and sat up. It is? I'll show you. He typed on his phone briefly and then lamented a lack of reception. Broderick and the owl, who had entered into a kind of staring contest, chose this moment to both let out strange, piteous noises and rather sobered the mood. Betty thought she'd try to recover the comical moment. What about 
those other birds that walk like drunken dancers, she said. <laughs> like how, asked Fraser, smirking as he waited for Betty to give up and try to demonstrate. Sort of like Betty leaned on her walker one-handed and attempted the wiggle walk of which she was speaking, jutting her chin in and out and swinging her shoulders back and forth. <laughs> Fraser promptly started filming her. But Betty found that she was so used to this by now that she no longer minded. Then they heard the crackle of an announcement speaker from outside the forest. The balloons had not all landed back where they had started, and the Scottish team, whose pilot had taken Carrie the crane aboard, was nowhere to be found. No. We're such nincompoops, Betty fretted. We didn't even give that man my name. <laughs> Don't worry, Fraser replied. This is where we put our Instagram following to use. He handed Betty Broderick. Look worried. He leaned in and took a selfie. <laughs> Fraser, I've told you, Carrie's Instagram isn't for my face. <laughs> Fraser waved Betty's objections away. No, no, don't you worry. We'll just say Carrie's a friend of all of us. He started typing. Graham and my good friend, well, my frenemy actually, but the humans make me say friend, at Carrie Crane, has got a bit lost on a hot air ballooning adventure here in Switzerland. You all know what she looks like, so if you see her, please message me so we can find each other again and cheer up our gran. Hashtag do it for the gram. Hashtag bring Carrie home. <laughs> at European hot air ballooning, please help. Carrie is with one of the Scottish teams, brackets, of course, because I'm the Scots pause. Fraser hit post. Now we wait. He led Betty back towards the main registration tent. Sure enough, about five minutes later, Fraser's phone buzzed and he opened Instagram to show a message from someone called The Floater. Hey, at the Scots pause, I'm one of the crew for the pilot who has Carrie Crane. We'll be in the pub called Das Mursch Kanichen in about an hour if you want to come and get her. I think she enjoyed the flight. See? Fraser poked Betty. Doing it for the gram can be quite useful. Yeah, yeah, replied Betty, smiling. Betty returned home. Carry the crane safely secreted back inside her purse. Very tired, but rather pleased with herself. She'd done a lot of things out of her comfort zone on this trip, and she felt that at 87 years old, it was all rather impressive. A little bit of her even kind of wished that she hadn't been so secretive about being the owner of Carrie Crane. But it was fun being sneaky. She unpacked her things and put on the kettle, then went next door in search of her cat, Fairy, who had been being cared for by her neighbour, Barb. Fairy was asleep on a pile of newspapers in Barb's magazine basket. At Barb's kitchen table sat Betty's daughter, Katie, and her granddaughter, Anae. Betty smiled and gave them all hugs. Nice Instagram, Grandma, commented Anae, once Betty had sat down. <laughs> Betty choked on her tea and had to be vigorously patted on the back by Barb. I don't know what you mean, she replied. <laughs> Yeah. And they rolled her eyes. Grandma, your face is in every picture. <laughs> Betty frowned. I beg your pardon? <laughs> and they held her phone so that Betty could see. Look, in this one, you're in the bakery window. See the reflection? And in this one, the Scots pause guy is taking a selfie next to you and you're in his shot. And in this one... Your face isn't in it, but that's definitely your top you always wear and your ring. And also, the Scots paws cat and the guy are photobombing you in, like, literally every picture as well. Look, he's there and there. She pointed out several more images of Fraser and Roderick peeking into Carrie Crane's backgrounds. <laughs> and you're all over his account, so you were obviously the one taking Carrie Crane's photos. I have to say, I was actually impressed at all the stuff you did, Grandma. The granny roller derby was pretty epic. <laughs> Betty wasn't sure whether to be cross or pleased. 
That sneaky young man, she grumbled into her tea. She thought about young Fraser, now travelling on his own with Roderick, and wondered how he was getting on. After a moment, she pulled out her phone and opened Instagram. Perhaps after all that, it was time she did a so-called reveal of the face behind Carrie Crane's account. Instagram blinked on the screen. It changed colour. The icons and menus slowly loaded, all in different positions. Oh, said Ine, leaning over. It's got an update. <laughs> Knickers, at Betty. Now how am I going to work out how to tell off that Fraser boy? <laughs> she poked various buttons and accidentally took a selfie. You look cross in that, Grandma, Ine commented. <laughs> I know, replied Betty, pretending it was intentional. She took a picture of Carrie by her cup of tea. She poked her glasses onto her nose and found the post button in a new corner of the screen. Carrie Crane. Home at last with grumpy human. At the Scots pause, my mum is unimpressed that you and your human photobombed us our whole trip. Swipe for her crossface. <laughs> also, Hashtag Gram Goes Wild is impolite, even if she was doing a wobbly bird dance. We dare you to post a picture of your human doing the owl lying down. Hashtag do it for the gram. Hashtag <laughs> it's not over. <laughs> That's oh, wow. so good. <laughs> Excellent. Good. I think you're going to have a lot of fun choosing an illustration for that um, story, mm. Sarah. That could yeah. Be a huge It'll be very fun. difficult. Which thing do I choose? Yeah. Hot air balloon, oh, yeah. an yeah. owl lying down? The, 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 roller, yeah. no, the roller derby <laughs> wheel, wheelchair thing. The roller derby, roller grand. No, roller grand. Frame with a speed roller grand. <laughs> I'm going to show and you then, something yeah. that's been sent to, to the Please. chat. I don't, can, you, can you see this? Oh, it's a cat. What's the cat got here? Roller skates. No. 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 The, I, I think they're patonk balls. Oh, patonk balls, no. they are. Oh, <laughs> well, fantastic. <laughs> I was going to say before, I, I thought you did a very good job of making Fraser extremely annoying but still lovable like i just yeah. kept going oh god oh he's such a pain oh he's so annoying with him. oh but oh but he means well <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's yeah. fraser and also in the end she had fun exactly she did. so any requests for next time Mm. Oh, oh and, and, and you have to come up with another phrase like do it do, do it for the ground. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 that is so much fun. People not filling out forms properly. That's oh the last, yeah. the last, <laughs> two, weeks, the last two weeks. No witness signature, no signature, no question answered. Oh dear. Doesn't get counted. Mm. I think just Filling in forms in general of any kind. Yeah. Well, some often forms there are, are very. Questions like, what's your favorite food? And they list three things and none of them are your favorite. <laughs> yes. So um, sometimes you don't fill out the form correctly because you can't because it's a bad form. <laughs> right. <laughs> but no, <and> also, <laughs> I think in this case, uh, <laughs> yeah. the form is actually fairly straightforward. <laughs> Yeah, I think so. I think trying to give instructions <laughs> that that guide people, like tell people how to do something, yes, with multiple steps correctly, mm -hmm. <laughs> is, yeah. is uh, uh, potentially a topic I could write quite a lot on. And so we got That's one in the chat: the, uh, um, yeah. clueless but enthusiastic sports audiences. Um, so people have no idea Ooh. of the rules or culture, but are very excited to, oh, yeah. to take part. <laughs> Yeah, that's, oh, good that's true that would be great because it drives you know people who really know a lot about sport crazy 
So yeah, um, that's true. Mark Mark Fletcher actually said, "I hate it when people say just kick it," and I thought, "Oh, <laughs> quite, quite often say just oh, kick okay. it." You know. uh, related to the last one, Mum wanted to add in people who are at a sports event. Um, for reasons other than watching the sport like they're there because uh -huh. their friends are there they want to hang out with their friends and that made me think of people who go to the gym to socialize yes which is usually, <laughs> usually it's guys going to the gym to socialize and they'll just sit on the machinery and talk to each other they're taking it up using. but they're not using yeah. it that's very annoying yeah yeah <laughs> Oh, I was just going to say, I thought, you know, the idea of instructions along the lines of giving directions, which nobody does anymore because everyone's got Google Maps. Mm. But it was always something which used to be quite funny and amusing when people try to describe, well, you just go up the road, you turn right at the pub, left, down a bit of a jig, go to the right, turn left again, and then up the road, and it's on your right. You can't miss it. Mm. <laughs> yeah. And you've got no idea what, what to do. Yeah, because there are too the many steps. Yeah. Yeah, you know, their instructions were just, only they could understand what they were telling you. <laughs> I realised that I always end up giving directions based on trees. Like, <laughs> I'll, say, I'll say, turn up there next to the big Norfolk pine. And the person might be like, the big what? The yeah, who? Yeah, the who so is that? Or I'll be like, oh, I remember. It was the one with all the apple trees along it. Or it was the one with that weird snaky tree. You know, the weird, like, yeah. sideways tree? It was that one. It was that road. <laughs> oh, that's good. That'd be, that'd be excellent. It's going to be even worse when you get into your sort of microflora and fauna and stuff. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> your direction's going to be really You're like, Oh, the really mothy. It had this really <laughs> great patch of moth, like, at the side of the road. <laughs> No, you use a, a correct classification of the particular oh, yeah, yeah. Of yeah, yeah, Scientific yeah. name. The tree that has <laughs> yeah. what Latin name hey, yeah. you know, was attached to the right-hand side. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, that really is no, uh, gi Giving but directions or instructions based on, like, knowledge that you've got. Yeah. Um, um, you've got yeah. Other Esoteric know. knowledge. Yeah, other people don't. Yeah. And, you know, even how different people do give directions. Mm. So Janie is really good at street names, but yeah. I'm hopeless at street names. Um, so I will do landmarks, which might be a building or <laughs> the sort of thing Anne's talking about, but doing plants is good. Yeah. You know, if you've got past the garden um, <laughs> yeah. uh, with all the plumbago on the front fence, you know, that's not yeah, helpful. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Got. That's it. Yeah. Then add on mm. um, taking slips, you know, like grandma's stealing cuttings. Oh, yeah. 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 Um, I also have a totally unrelated request. Yeah. If you want to just throw something else in, which is um, personality tests. Ooh. Oh, yeah. okay. <laughs> and another one from the chat, which is um, kids finding more things that are more fun to do than the expensive or like long awaited thing that you've booked in to do <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> yes yeah yesterday we got a new fridge and I was very excited about it um and except I had to try really hard not to ask the guy if I could keep the fridge the box, box. <laughs> box so big yes. and I was just thinking Gee, that's such a good cubby house. No, I don't need a box for a cubby house. It's so good, though. It's the perfect cubby house in one box. <laughs> so cool. I'll add another one, um, resistant yep. materials, because I did a test of paper crane, but it was, <laughs> it was too red, resistant. red printing paper, paper, and it didn't like to bend in the right uh, place. Yeah. Right, so we've got uh, people not filling out forms properly, and related, filling out forms that are really bad or hard to fill in. <laughs> um, clueless but enthusiastic sports audiences, people who are at the sports event for reasons other than watching the sport, people who are at the gym for reasons other than doing gym workouts, <laughs> um, trying to give detailed instructions or directions, directions based on things only you know about, such as tree species, uh, taking slips or cuttings, personality tests, Kids finding things that are more fun to do than the expensive or long-awaited activity and resistant materials. Um, 
that's, that's a, great that's a fun list that so we'll fun. see what i can do with yeah. that um yep and what's our date yes I, I, I will just just check that the next date for us june 11th june 11th okay good mm-hmm. June 11th for our, our next story with those things in and before we wrap up I, I just want to grab a paper pane I've actually got loads of paper cranes and quite a nice little display behind me but you can't see it because the sun's too bright um yeah but, you know here's one one two three four five them. six seven this is eight yeah. um paper cranes <laughs> in my background and and Beautiful. one little bunny mascot friend yeah um and nice. and i want to point out the really good hot air balloon behind uh <laughs> the timmons really nice. with with yeah. toys getting a ride um and, and mascot creatures in the background i did spot lammy and um charmaine's platypus still there um on the cat yeah. scratch <laughs> post before <laughs> There they are. <laughs> yes, until they were at risk. <laughs> they got at risk. Yes, that was a that cat was having a, a very um a, an enthusiastic but clueless sport time, perhaps. <laughs> Have you got a crow, Jane? It's a crow. It's a crow. Your crow mascot. Hey. It's yeah. a sports <laughs> mascot toy. That's a great yeah, one. Very appropriate. <laughs> Thanks for watching people catching up retrospectively and thanks everyone for coming with all your mascots and cranes and things. And we will be back on June 11th. So say see you to people watching and um, see you other people.